Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have Valerie Vermerlin, who is a electronic musician, a math teacher, a data analyst. He's got a lot going on. He's using data from black holes to make his latest album. He's there's so much cool stuff that's going to be probably a bit over my head. And I've already explained that to Valerie, so he knows. And hopefully it'll be an interesting conversation, but I think it's a really cool way to create music in untraditional ways, sort of futuristic ways. Um, when I first heard about you, Valerie, I saw your website, music production slash cybernetic sound design. And right away I was like, awesome. It, it's futuristic. It sounds... Um, I thought of the Terminator and I thought of just um, this sort of like uh, dystopian future that I think we were kind of getting to a little bit, um, how we're, we're in such an interesting time in the world where so much is changing so fast and we need to really um, be careful <laughs> before we turn too many knobs and open too many doors uh, for, an, for an interesting future. But um, I'm really happy to have you on the show. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for uh, for uh, yes for having me. So uh, I'm also very uh, looking forward to the conversation. So uh. yeah, this is a really cool thing that um, is is definitely new to me. Um, a way of creating music using data from black holes, if I'm understanding this correctly. Yes. I'll tell you um, just a short backstory. I did. Um, do you remember, I'm sure you do, a couple of years ago, they captured the sound of gravitational waves? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I took a sample of that and put it in and made a drum rack out of it and made some, you know, playable instruments with it, which I thought was really fun. But I think that is just um, very much the tiniest tip of the iceberg of what you've gotten yourself into. Yeah, I saw that, I think, uh, on a, I saw that on a YouTube, uh, yeah. It was really cool. Yeah. yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't stumble upon a, but uh, yes, uh, I, yeah, I, it was shown to me, so it's very nice. Um, I was marketing it as the oldest drum sound ever made. Ah, and did you, <laughs> uh, you spread it around probably then the whole drum rack or? Yeah, it's a free download for Ableton Live users, so um, ah, that you can cool. use um, probably, I guess it's like a millions and millions of years old sound that finally reached earth <laughs> yes yes it's true yes yes yeah yeah so i had a, I had a little bit of similar experience um so with micrometers it's a project that started in uh, 2014 so it's it's quite a while ago um and it started in fact as a commissioned work uh for a festival the dutch electronic arts festival and my brother who's also doing uh, space art a bit more visually uh, he invited me to do uh, like a, a commission piece uh, for the festival uh, and they wanted to do something on space and sound. That was a little bit the topic because at that time I studied music production here in uh, city in uh, Ghent. So that's the city where I'm living. It's mm. uh, a city in uh, Belgium. Uh, so uh, in, when you're studying music production, normally they train you to produce pop music. So I was, I was trained to produce pop music and then more direction electronic music. Um, but um, I got a little bit stuck uh, in the, the whole uh, EDM genre kind of electronic dance music um, and then uh, this project came along and normally it was a one time thing so I, I would only do it one time that was the original idea uh, and then I started uh, looking at uh, NASA and seeing if I could maybe do some things with, with some data from space and deep space uh, and then uh, this is how the first performance series, because we, we call it performance series for Micrometas, got into life. And the idea was to make um, a sonic representation of a voyage from Earth to the center of the Milky Way, only using sound, sure. so no visuals. Um, and there also I could use some data from some neutron stars, some recordings, and they were approximately, I think, 27, 28,000 years old, the same as you had, well, not a million years old, but it was the same principle. And when they come from 27, right. 28,000 light years away, it means that the, the light, uh, because the signals uh, are electromagnetic waves and light is a special kind of electromagnetic wave, they mm. take uh, 27, 28,000 years to reach us. So, uh, and in your case, yes, it sh should have been millions of years. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
You know, this is a pretty cool thing in in far as it's got this thematic thing that you've defined beforehand. Yeah. Right. So you came up with this idea of the space music, right? And the journey into the center of the galaxy. And I guess that really would inform a lot of the decisions you make as far as the music, the sound, the the sources of the sound as well. Yes, of course, because um, of course, what I always try to do is use my own imagination. I just, it's just a very nice inspiration, I think, mm. uh, to to work in, in in that field, because everything is possible. A lot of things, okay, people have worked with space sounds, but you can make make it your own. Um, and of course, um, I, yeah, I like I like to work a little bit then as a scientist. For example, for the the piece on the. Uh, the journey from the Earth to the center of the Milky Way. First, I had to figure out how can you get there. So <laughs> and then you cannot use Google Maps or something like that. So you have to start digging. Like, okay, first you go in, in the Milky Way, and then you, uh, sorry, in our galaxy, and then you go out of our galaxy. You have the Kuiper Belt, and then you have the outer region of our solar system. But the further you go, the less things are unknown. Uh, and then you try to figure out which data is available, what data can you use, and then based on that, you can make tracks on, for example, you can make a track on the rings of Saturn, or you make a track on, on this, of course, the sun, or you make a track on, on Neptune, or you make a sun um, a track on, 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 a, on a cluster uh, that is further away. So um, that's a little bit... Uh, and I, it's a little bit like every track is an, a small kind of scientific project, in which you try to generate sounds, inspiration, and then once you c you've cooked enough material, you can you can make a whole track out of it, or you make a couple of tracks and then you choose the best track. So yeah, um. yeah, I like how this having this thematic idea gets gets the wheels turning, and I think in a, in so many projects I've worked on, and a lot of people that actually like get their work done. It usually starts with this idea. It's so fun to go into your studio and just be like, let's see what happens. But when you have this picture, you know, now now it's more of like you, you've got the canvas already. Now we have to fill it in. We have to flesh it out. It's a great way of working. I think um, I'm, I'm curious though. So you're you're taking, I guess, numerical data from... You said from Saturn's rings. So how? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> how sometimes, does that become? Yeah. Music. Well, for those those tracks, sometimes you also can use some sonifications that were done by, for example, uh, yeah, NASA has done some sonifications or ESA. So that's that's and other th other things. There's a lot of material from the Voyager satellites, numerical data, that you can also uh, also get. And then uh, the thing is to. Um, to, yeah, then you have to program your own synthesizers to do the sonification. So there's two ways to uh, to do that. Uh, I mean, that was for the for the first series of Micrometas, and that has a first EP, but the EP was never released. I mean, I just put it on SoundCloud. You also see it on my website. Uh, but it's only as of so after the first project. Um, I wanted to go because I'm also trained as a as a theorist. Well, a mathematician. So my s I was specialized into the mathematical theory of superstring theory. So, and superstring theory is a theory in which people are looking for ways to combine uh, quantum physics and general relativity. So, quantum physics is the physics of everything that's super small. So, uh, the smaller you go, and probably you heard about it. And if you zoom, I would have a, a very big microscope, and you zoom in very tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, things start moving, so things are not fixed anymore. And this gives a lot of very interesting problems. And the logic of the quantum world is completely different than our own everyday logic. And then on the other hand, of course, we have the theory of general relativity, GR. Uh, it dates from 1915 with the publication of Einstein. Of it. so this, is, this is the theory of Einstein. And that describes everything that is or very heavy. Uh, or that moves super, super fast. Uh, so if you want to describe a, a light particle, that's a photon. I have, we have all <laughs> in our studios a lot of photons going on. You need GR to describe them. But if you have something that's very small uh, and very heavy, where a lot of mass is concentrated in a very tiny point in space, or space-time as it's called in GR, uh, then you need the two th theories together. And... An example of such a situation is a black hole. So what is basically a black hole? A black hole 
um, is the process when you have mass and you would compress it very you would be a giant for example and you could compress the earth to the size of an of an uh, how is it called eight, it's 0 0.8 centimeters uh, you can compare it to a little little uh, fruit or <laughs> yeah. um then mathematically it will disappear and it will create a little black hole of with a with a diameter of 0 0.8 centimeter um and the thing is the black hole so it has it, it's it's defined in one point in space time or in space where there's a sort of a very a lot of mass in a super tiny tiny region so it's it has a very a high density of mass but it's very tiny it's all, mathematically it's infinitely small and to describe what's going on in this region you need quantum physics and gr general relativity and no one uh, up to now and there's that's a super big problem in physics so it's it's been around over i think 100 years this problem or almost 100 years now so um and super string theory to make the connection is was or is i don't know physicists gonna shoot me now <laughs> or I don't know, um, uh, was a very good candidate to find a new theory for, uh, we call it quantum gravity, to have those two theories together. And my PhD was situated in the mathematical part, so I had to do a sort of, a, you could say, um, a classification. So if you look at general relativity, the theory of Einstein, um, it was built around a lot of geometry. So it's all geometrical surfaces, so if you study it mathematically, and the geometry was developed by Riemann in the, in the 20th century, a mathematician. And he classified, he studied all those geometrical structures. Now, it's superstring theory is a generalization of um, uh, general relativity. So you have, again, s some sort of geometrical structures that are at the foundation. Uh, and the work in my PhD was to classify. I worked at the program to classify all those geometrical structures. And it was super fascinating because... Um, the, these were geometrical structures which had an infinite amount of dimensions. So here, we're sitting here in my room, I have three dimensions, you have three dimensions. In GR we have four, because we have time. Time is also an extra dimension. Uh, but in the geometries that I was studying, it was like infinitely many. So, uh, And um, I finished my PhD in 2005, so then I left mathematics. Um, because I was very, I got interested in the, the problem of um, quantum gravity when I was, I, I think, it, 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 as a teenager. I don't know. I just got got into the library and I started reading books and I got into the the whole quantum uh, physics. I was also very attracted to mathematics. Um, so I had a dream that, like, maybe one day if I could work in this field, that would be amazing. But of course, I was also doing music. So it's always these two devils or angels, how you would call them. Um, and then after my PhD in 2001, I decided to try to match, um, combine my interest for mathematics and music. So put a little bit of music more at the forefront. Uh, and then I, I lost a little bit the, the, um, yeah, the idea of, of applying my research of my PhD and the knowledge that I could gain um, for musical purposes. And this now it got back because of the Black Hole album. So, and mm -hmm. this Micrometas was really the start because with the first series, it was not so mathematical. I mean, it was a lot about also algorithmic composition techniques. So using Maximus P, pure data, to program new software, to turn those numbers using data sonification into sounds. But now with the black hole piece, it was, a, it was also a question for me. It was an, a challenge that I put myself, is it possible? I mean, because I had the idea, I think in 2016, uh, I had to play a gig with uh, in uh, in Berlin with friends in Berlin uh, for a collective. It was very nice. They did a very nice piece. It was music, classic music goes deep space. So I had to play with my my piece, and then there was a wonderful um, classical ensemble playing uh, classical music related to space. Um, and it was a whole bunch super inspiring uh, uh, people over there, uh, and. Yeah, this is also where I got the idea of the black holes. Maybe do something with black holes. And we're like, oh, maybe yes or no. Or it was a little bit, you know, uh, is, is it, is it going to be possible or not? Um, and then I, uh, I said, okay, I'm going to try to see if I can understand the physics. Because I was out so long, since 2001. Of course, I've, I've been working since a data scientist as, uh, as of 2005. 
but that's another kind of mathematics. I mean, yeah, that's more applied mathematics. You have pure mathematics, applied mathematics. Um, and I think the start was going to a conference on black hole astrophysics uh, in Frankfurt at the High Energy Physics Institute. I, yeah, the exact name I have to... Uh, um, and there it was a real eye-opener because I studied a little bit, again, the mathematics. I had to study a little bit of uh, GR and a little bit looking at quantum physics. And there I saw a lot of... it. Well, yeah, I was really completely again into this beautiful world uh, that also is very imaginative. I mean, it's a lot about imagination. I still remember going to the mm -hmm. talks at, uh, at this conference on black hole astrophysics. Uh, and then typically um, the people who would give the talks, the scientists, so the, the scientists, they give their or her talk. And then at the end, somebody from the audience would uh, ask the question, but is it physical? And in the beginning, I was like, okay, what are they asking? And, and at the end of the conference, I knew uh, that the question, if they ask this question and uh, they wanted to ask, but does it have something to do with reality, what you're telling here? And then the scientist would say, um, yes, maybe, or no, 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 or... <laughs> you see, I mean, it's, it's a lot about... It becomes like science fiction, but real scientific science fiction. So, um, and this got me really inspir inspired. So I thought, okay, maybe there's things you can do there, because, of course, I, I didn't know how hard it would be to get the data out of it. Uh, and then um, it lingered on a little bit, and then it really started um, because of Concertgebouw Brugge. That's an, um, a concert venue. Uh, it, it's, it's a very big concert venue for classical music in the region. They decided to co-produce uh, the, the whole the piece. And, and, this is, and they also got me in, in touch with some scientists. And also because of going to the conference, I already had some really good contacts with people, uh, uh, including, for example, Professor Matthias, uh, uh, Dr. Matthias Kaminski, He's from the Alabama State Un um, University of Alabama, uh, and together with his student Casey Cartwright, they could they they are specialized into um, researching what happens if you uh, basically generate black holes in parallel universes. Is this again relates to string theory? Because in string theory, you normally we have four dimensions, so that's Einstein said there's four dimensions. But then the people in string theory said, no, 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 there is 23 dimensions in the first version. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, people are like, okay. Uh, but they have a very clever way in uh, getting away with 23 dimensions because they say there's four observable dimensions at the macroscopic level. And then there's 19 dimensions and they're curled up in tiny little microscopic dimensions so we don't see them. So... And then the later versions had like, I think, 10 or 9, uh, 10 dimensions, I think, if I'm, I'm not uh, wrong. And the group of Kaminsky, they use this, uh, this aspect to generate black holes in parallel universes. And then they um, uh, perturb the black holes. What does it mean to perturb them? They disturb them a little bit. They throw a couple of planets into the black holes. And whenever a black hole, you, you threw, uh, throw um, matter into a black hole, it, it's like a burp that it gives. And this is the famous gravitational waves that come out. Uh, and then the gravitational waves are the only messenger particles, only way to communicate between our universe and a parallel universe. So, and what they then do is and they see how these, um, these um, um, gravitational waves enter our universe. And this is the, the data that they give me. So, uh, but to give you a little bit of an idea, it's a lot about image because it's like phew, you're, you're talking. I mean, this is not so everyday uh, way of thinking, but it's very interesting to see that. I mean, a lot of research is, is and it makes sense and, and we can probably do things with it uh, more than we, we initially think. So, um, mm. Well, it's definitely difficult to imagine any other dimensions of perception. Uh, I think if we lived in a 2D world, to imagine that there was a third dimension would, you know, be almost impossible. <laughs> and so this, this imagining of 19 additional ones is, you know, that's, I think I'm going to have to just accept that I'm not going to understand that anytime soon. No, but no one, I mean, there's, it's, 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 it's not an, 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 an it's all 
theoretical, right? It's theoretical, but um, uh, as of now, I mean, there's a lot of observations that are being done or that are planned to try to figure out if it is true or not. There is ways to try to figure out uh, if there's extra dimensions or not. One way would be to, and that's what they discovered, tried to discover in CERN, uh, so the Large uh, Hydrant Collider, so these particle accelerators. Mm. Uh, one of the research programs, but I, I read that, I mean, they didn't find it yet, is to try to find microscopic black holes. So those are tiny, tiny, tiny mi little uh, mi um, black holes. And if they would exist, then this can be proof of maybe having extra dimensions. Uh, so that's one way. Other way I read was um, also studying, I think, gravitational waves that are being emitted by mergers of black holes or very, very heavy objects. We're also looking at other neutron stars, I thought, were also might contain information about possible extra dimensions. I mean, it's it's not... Um, I don't think it's... Uh, because, um, yeah, we're human. Eh? We only have our senses, but reality is so much more. We live in... A, we cannot go out of reality. That's the big problem, and that's an, an old philosophical problem. Cannot put mm. yourself out of reality and look. Ah, yeah, okay, it looks like that's not possible. Right, we can't perce perceive things. We don't have the senses mm. to pick no. up. No, but but the nice well, thing I is, I believe. It. Yeah. Yes. I don't know. Yeah, I was said. Well, now go ahead. No, before I. Oh yeah. No, the nice thing is, of course, uh, <laughs> when going into the whole project, I, I also started to realize because I didn't know it before that I mean these crazy ideas like extra dimensions or hey, time travel. That's another old classic uh, idea. Mm. Um, you can really um, put up some experiments and, and try to figure it out if it's possible or not, and, and that's crazy. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Do you think we can time travel? Uh, yes, of course. That's another. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's two ways, of course. If you if you yes. do. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> but uh, maybe a little bit uh, discouraging. So going into the future theoretically is not difficult. I mean, every every theoretical physicist. I guess we're always going into the future, right? That's one thing. <laughs> Automatically, but it's faster to go faster. Eh? That, that, right. I mean, uh, every theoretical physicist. You're in the future. You're I'm, about yes. five or six hours ahead of me right now. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> yes. But I mean, that is the future because uh, we have, as humans, in, uh, a convention on on the time zone, of course. Mm -hmm. That's a different. I mean, it's really about time. Uh, the 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 real. I mean, the entity of time. And to go into the future faster, so if I would want to go faster or you want to go faster, for example, you want to see uh, how, would, how would, would it be like um, with all the climate change things going on, it would be good to see a uh, hundred years, hopefully everything is mm. under control or not. Uh, a way to do that um, would be to uh, take a spaceship um, and a spaceship that travels very, very fast. You've probably heard about it, Twin Paradox. Yes, with the one one yes. goes real fast. Two twins get on two separate spaceships. One goes really fast, and they I forget exactly who comes back having aged. And I'll let you tell it. But yeah. They're, so they're, they're it's 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 like the person who's in the spaceship and the uh, the spaceship that moves very fast from Earth. Let's say it moves at zero point nine the speed of light. Um, they come back. For them, time goes slower. Uh, relative to our time. So if they uh, have traveled one hour, they come back and maybe on Earth a thousand years have passed or more have passed. Mm. So that's one way. The other way uh, is to find a neutron star or a black hole um, to travel in the vicinity of um, uh, a black hole or a neutron star because there the gravitational forces are very strong. And the thing is, the more gravity you experience, the slower your your um, your personal time will go, and by personal time I don't mean um, your uh, your personal experience time, but this is really um, the physical time that's attached to your world line. We call it a world line in physics. Everyone goes to space time in a world line, um, and so if you would go with a spaceship in the vicinity of a black hole, you have to stay a little bit away because it's dangerous. Uh, you have the same situation because uh, the gravity slows down time. So you stay there one hour, blah, blah, blah. You go back and a million years have passed on Earth. Perfectly possible. Mm -hmm. And this is also something time at sea level goes slower than time in Mount Everest. That's also because of, of GR. It's tiny. It's very a fraction. But if we 
would not um, calculate those uh, effects of GR into, for example, our cell phones, GPS, GPS will not work. So GPS has mm. an, a relativistic correction for time to make it work. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That this this is one one <laughs> example of like yeah, yeah. So us people like here living in New York, close to the water, rushing around all the time, we're uh, passing. That's why our lives go by fast. So if we were hanging out in the mountains. But it's <laughs> it's yeah, almost it's so unnoticed. I mean, you cannot. <laughs> yes, but theoretically, yes, that's that's the fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it does affect our perception of time in a way, right? Because like when we're busy, when we're moving fast, like time just flies. That's another our perceptual uh, time. Yes, that's another another issue. Of course, I don't have a lot of. No, that's more psychology, and that's true. That's true. That's mm. another the personal perception. Yes, that's another interesting. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just from the physics point of view. I mean, uh, because you can you can measure it using atomic clocks, or they do it with airplanes, and then I mean, you really you really see the effects of of uh, GR. I mean, uh, but the big problem is, and that's back to the future, is going to the past, because of course, um, there if you go, would go to the past, then you have the the paradox or you could kill your i mean it's not a <laughs> nice thing to say but you could kill your you parents kill your for example it's yeah. like what happens <laughs> in back to the future um right. and then a lot of things uh, problems arise but um uh, there is a solution to the einstein equations uh, and it gave rise to something which we call wormholes i think they were discovered in 1916 i'm not pretty sure uh, it's called an einstein rosen bridge um, and those are connections you make between two points in space-time. So we have four-dimensional space-time. But then you can, you even have a, it's something which you call hyperspace around space-time. And the Einstein-Rosen bridge connects a wormhole, uh, sorry, a white hole. That's a reverse of a black hole to a black hole. And a white hole is something that pushes um, matter out uh, at, a at a very high velocity. Uh, you cannot go back in. Um, and this uh, makes it possible to travel into the past, theoretically. But the big problem with the wormholes is that if you, you just put one tiny little electron or a proton or an elementary particle into... So you, you first you create the wormhole, theoretically, but you put something little into it, it, it collapses. It is the stability of the uh, wormhole is the same as if I would try to um, uh, put this pencil straight ahead onto my thumb, it's almost impossible because, the, 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 I mean, physically, I would have to be like mm -hmm. a, a robot. And even then, it's, it's, it's the same problem that arises. But the good thing is uh, <laughs> that uh, I think a year, year or a year and a half ago, um, there was a collaboration between Malda Sena. So he's one of the most proficient physis physicists for the mo moment working on problems related to quantum gravity and a Chinese physicist, I think, I've, I don't know his name anymore, they found an, uh, a workaround to the fact that if you put a tiny element into the wormhole, it collapses. So they found a solution that maybe the wormhole could remain stable. And this gives possibilities to travel into the past. So, yeah, but this is all speculative, well. of course. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. That's, yeah, I feel like I'm going to be sitting on the other end here saying, whoa, a lot. No, 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 no it's not, that's not, not my, no, no, it's not my, but it's just to give you a little bit an impression of um, yeah. the well, science the fiction. imagination too. And, yes, um, yes, yeah. Now, if I understand black holes correctly, um, the gravity is so dense or so powerful that not even light can escape it, which is why it gets the name black hole. Yes. Um, and I think uh, for a, quite a while they were just theoretical yes. until relatively recently, right? Well, uh, we the, kind of yeah, had the proof. So, so yeah, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is um, they're so hard to observe. It must be hard to get the data for you in the music creation process. Yes, yes. Or, or maybe some there's breakthrough. I'm not sure, but uh, I, I guess that would. That, that presents a problem, right? 
it's uh, very interesting also so the news about the in, in the new album so it appeared on a, a lot of electronic uh, music websites so they took it all over it was very nice of course but i didn't expect it so it was for example dj mac i mean uh, famous for the the top 100 dj kind of stuff they put it on their website and it was on mix mac or music tech also and then if you see the comments of the people it's uh, it's also you get you get this uh, reaction that people say, but there is nothing coming out of a black hole. I mean, this this is this is a hoax. I mean, it's not true. <laughs> um, and I understand that, of course. Yes, it's a black hole, so nothing can come out. There's no information that comes out, and we we only can observe the gravitational waves if we're lucky that two black holes meet and and merge. Uh, but for the rest, I mean, um, of course, if I say there's no information. To coming out uh, it's not exactly true because that is that is what Hawking proved us uh, showed us with his work so basically Hawking and Bekenstein uh, they discovered that black holes they have a temperature and they evaporate over time and in the evaporation mm. process they emit information so there's particles coming out but very very slowly the thing is if you have a black hole they have different sizes and shapes if you have a black hole that has uh, the mass of the sun, for example, you can calculate ev evaporation time, but it will be maybe longer than the, the whole whole um, whole existence of the universe. So it's just basically not possible. Uh, but well, would yeah. they theoretically, if they're constantly pulling things into it through its gravitation, would it eventually? Collapse everything. You say it evaporates? Yeah, so I can say, wouldn't it eventually just pull everything into it? And it yes. Is, that this, is, is this the Big Bang? No, <laughs> Big Crunch. It, so you could so, uh, call it uh, the Big Crunch. The opposite yes. of the Big Bang? Uh, or you have the, the, the yeah, theory that there's a Big Bang and then it, it grows together again, again a Big Bang. Together again, so it's, this this right. is called uh, the theory of multiverse theory. Um, okay. But the thing is, uh, that's right what you say. There was a big problem in physics because um, black holes, um, when before Hawking, Stephen Hawking and Bekenstein, there was a problem with black holes because uh, they would uh, act as vacuum cleaners in space. So they would eat all the mass, and mass has structure. Mass can be uh, a, 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 a nebula or a planet or a star, it has something which we call an entropy in physics. That's a structure. And the more chaotic something is, um, um, the higher the entropy is. Uh, and things tend to evolve towards a high entropy. This is also classically, if I take this glass and I just drop it on the floor, so now it has a, a, a rather um, a low entropy because it has structure. It has a sort of a geometrical structure and if I put it on the ground, the entropy rises because it's all shattered in little particles. So, I mean, little, there's more, more information about the glass because now I can describe the glass with, if I know the height, if I know the diameter of this, and I know it's a glass, I can perfectly re reconstruct it. And I know the thickness of the glass. So if I drop it, it's not the case. And black holes acted as a sort of a vacuum cleaners because um, normally, Things in nature evolve towards a, a state of a higher entropy. That's called the second law of thermodynamics. You cannot go backwards. Because otherwise it would mean that all the particles of the glass could by magic come together and form the glass again. Statistically and from the point of quantum mechanics, it's always possible, but I have never, ex I mean, no one has ever experienced something like that. And because of black holes are like vacuum cleaners of space, they would lower the entropy of the universe. So this was a big problem because you would violate the second law of thermodynamics and as you say, you would make the universe very homogeneous uh, and very low entropy state. But I mean, this is completely uh, contradicting a very important law in physics. Uh, and this is uh, what was so genius about the work of Bekenstein and of, um, of uh, Hawking that they proved by proving that um, black holes evaporate, this information, this, this, this chaos that they uh, sucked in, they gave it back to the universe. So the problem of uh, lowering the entropy in this way was, was solved. Uh, mm. Yeah, so, 
And the thing about a lot of black holes, like pulling together, pulling together and forming a super, 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 super massive black Yeah, that's maybe one hypothetical, I mean, but that's very unlikely that it happens, of course. But now I think because the first black hole confirmed was confirmed in 1971. Uh, it's Cygnus X uh, and it's an, um, a double star system. So uh, I think it's a red giant if I'm... Yeah, a red giant is like the sun, our sun will become a red giant. It's something uh, the sun will blow up basically and then it will be become very, very, very huge but gas-like. Uh, and the uh, companion of the double star system of Cygnus X, so it's a, a, a red giant swirling around another astrophysical object. And by doing calculations, this object was confirmed to be a black hole in 1971. So from mm. that moment on, we know that they exist. And now uh, it is thought that there's a zillion and zillion black holes. I mean, the one in the, the center of our Milky Way is, I think, 40 million masses of the sun together. That's called a supermassive black hole. The biggest black mm. holes are, I think, a couple of billion uh, times the mass of the sun. So, but for the album, of course, um, yeah, this is a problem. Uh, so, two comments I get is there's no sound in space, which is correct. And then I, was gonna, I, was gonna, I mean, yes, the alien movie uh, in space, no one I can hear you scream. I yes, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the whole beautiful. You have all the very beautiful Star Wars sounds of the. I don't know how these spaceships. Yeah. Uh, beautiful, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the movie just, would be a lot less exciting without. Yes, that. <laughs> suppose uh, imagine without sound, it would be very boring. Um, uh, and there's no information coming out, no sound. And that you can solve using uh, simulations. But of course, uh, to work with those simulated data, I didn't do it all by myself. I mean, first, I don't, I'm not an expert in uh, black hole astrophysics. Uh, and secondly, uh, I don't have the computing power to, to, to calculate everything. So I had to collaborate. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, for example, uh, I, one of the collaborators was the Center for Plasma Astrophysics at the Catholic University of Leuven. And what they're doing is um, they're trying to simulate, for example, what happens. You have a black hole in the center of a sort of a VR environment. Um, you take a sun kind of object and then you, you let this, this black hole uh, devour this sun. How does, it, how does it happen? And it turns out that a lot of the physics is physics that we knew from, uh, from a, a quite, quite a long time ago. It's physics that's related to fluid dynamics. So the equations are very similar to trying to simulate what happens, for example, uh, when you take two fluids and you pour them together. Very difficult mathematically, very beautiful, very difficult to... Uh, um, and for these simulations, they were simulated on a cluster computer. And so it means uh, they hire, I don't know, uh, an afternoon or a day, a computing power, but it means you have a computer at your disposal of, I don't know, 20, 40,000 CPUs at the same time in parallel, calculating. Mm -hmm. uh, and what comes out is very beautiful. It, uh, I, I, they got me the data. It's like a cube of 4,096, 4,096, 4,096, all little blocks. And there you see every frame in time is like, I think it was one or two gigabytes of data one time frame and you get a couple of hundreds of time frames and then you can there's software to to uh, render it in a sort of a 2d environment and then you beautifully see the star completely being devoured by the black hole mm. but the, the the lesson here is of course that you have to try to collaborate i mean phew, that is something that you cannot do uh I, I, yeah so uh yeah um yeah that's interesting that it creates recognizable shapes yes like you said uh, and very precise yes um, it might it sort of speaks to some kind of connection some kind of like universal law or something that is tying everything together yes of course i mean um, or is it or is it the interpretation of the data that we're making it mm. is, is that it's the mathematics that's behind it because mm. of course um, a lot of those simulations are governed by mathematical equations um, 
And those are equations that uh, can be applied in different situations. Like the fluid dynamics with those uh, fluid dynamic kind of equations. These are called Laplace equations for the mathematicians who are listening to the podcast or physicists. Um, they originally uh, were used to simulate the behavior of fluids. So it's because you have a sort of a mathematical machinery that you can apply in different situations. So, uh, for example, the, 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 the origin of string theory, so string theory basically proposes that matter, we think matter is built out of tiny little elementary particles like electrons, neutrons, quarks. Um, but string theory th says, no, there's even more fundamental particles and they're not particles, but they're tiny little strings. Uh, and the only characteristic of the strings is they vibrate. Uh, and their only characteristic is how how sturdy they are. That gives that gives the the, the property of the strings. But if you look at the mathematics of the super string uh, string theory, it's all related to uh, real world strings, like on a guitar. So I mean, it's much a little bit more complicated than that, but um, it has a lot of connections to that. So it's again because we know. Uh, the mathematics of uh, vibrations, we know it very well. And then there were physicists uh, in the start of string theory, and it origi originated from another field. I think it originated from the study of condensed matter physics, also a very interesting uh, field that gives a lot of new ideas for uh, theoretical physics. Um, um, so it came from another field, and then people started thinking about those strings, applying the mathematics of vibrations that we know better and better. And then something new came out. So, yeah. Mm. So, I mean, this is a very musical theory, string theory, because, of course, it connects vibrations also. Uh, yeah. Um, Which is really all sound is. It's Yes, yes, of course. Particles moving yes. in, in yes. the air, really, right? Um, yes. I've heard the, the sense of hearing described really like the sense of touch. It's just... Um, moving particles touching those little pieces and those little tiny uh, hairs in your ears yeah and the in the eardrum and it's actually the air moving physical touch which e i guess which is why we feel the bass in our chest when we go to like see a concert and yeah yeah and and there you also feel i think physically the bass that's uh but your ear for example there's also a very beautiful connection between your ear and we're talking here because of uh, this is possible because of um, compression techniques of audio. Otherwise, we would not be able, and also our, our visuals are being compressed using MP3 or MPEG or, or other kind of codecs. And this is all based on Fourier analysis. And Fourier analysis is basically, um, it was again this mathematical discovery. I think it was 18th century Fourier, the discovery that every um, that was a result. Every sound wave, you can find an, a fundamental wave in a sound wave, and it's composed of a fundamental wave and harmonic or inharmonic overtones if you put them together. Mm. Um, and if you study um, the way how your ear works, your ear does a sort of an inverse Fourier transform in a natural way. So what will happen in your ear is that you have a sound, and your ear will do a sort of a spectrum. We all know Ableton and we have spectrum in Ableton that you can see perfectly all the different. That's what's happening in your ear in a natural way using the hairs that you say. And so there's the hairs that are, are uh, moving. And the interpretation is just because of a neural network inside your brain that is interpreting. But the way that we, we, we work with digital audio, it's for me very fascinating because it is very inspired by how nature works. So, uh, and it's maybe because, yeah, maybe as humans, we, yeah, we found a way to tap into how we work internally, n not in a very conscious way, but uh, there's a lot of similarities also there going on. So, uh, yeah, a whole universe inside the head. Yes, and of course, your eyes, your eyes, your eyes yeah. is the same principle. I mean, I have not such a, a big knowledge about how you're. I mean, but it's a similar kind of working. And as you say, your sense, your that I don't know. Yeah, is it also your sense, like 
sort of a your taste you mean or your your smell yeah i guess any of them right like it's all yeah. gets interpreted and decoded it uh, that happens in our our brain not really outside of it no 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 yeah but but it seems like maybe because I don't like the the whole new age statement so much like everything is vibrations and it's all energy and okay it's true <laughs> I mean but yeah I'm a scientist also um mm. but waves yeah waves are very important yeah so uh yeah the sine wave or other kind of waves um yeah and with the black hole album uh, sometimes so I did collaborations sometimes I got software that also happened. So um, uh, there was a an, um, an, uh, PhD student, Fabio Baccini. He gave me software to calculate behavior of uh, different kind of particles near black holes. So if you throw a little electron and you shoot it with an, uh, with an electron gun in a certain angle with a certain speed, and <laughs> what happens? In, uh, how does it behave? And the black hole also can have different properties. So uh, basically, a, a black hole... And uh, they say in uh, physics, uh, black holes have no hair. So there's an, uh, the, a very funny name of the no hair theorem in black hole astrophysics. That's an official <laughs> theorem. Imagination. And the, yeah, the no hair theorem states that the only properties that are important to discern a black hole are its mass, so how, how heavy it is. Uh, it can be, uh, it can have a charge, so it can be have a sort of an, a, a load, a load on it, uh, itself. And the third property is it, or it can be spinning or non-spinning. And if it is spinning, it has something which we call an angular momentum. So that's the energy, the spinning energy. And those are the only three properties that a black hole has. So for the rest, it has no structure. So if you throw a whole building, if you throw a whole New York into the black hole that has a lot of structure and a lot of things going on, Everything disappears. So the only thing that will happen is the black hole will have a little bit more mass. It can get a little bit of charge, more or less, and it can start spinning or not. That's the only uh, only thing. Um, so, um, and this is also what was used in the software that I got from uh, Fabio Baccini. He, you could you could simulate like if it's spinning like this it has a mass it's charged or not and this all gives different kind of behavior but this was software i mean that that's it, it it's his specialty it's his phd i mean right uh, yeah yeah you don't have an electric electron gun laying around that you can no 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 i don't know <laughs> if it even exists i'm saying electron i don't know no 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 or to yeah to to see if it's correct yeah. or not no no yeah no uh, but of course, if you want to do that, and then, then I wear my hat again as a, f uh, a mathematician or a physicist, then you have to use a mathematical software. For example, use Octave or other kind of software packages to, um, because it's not because you get a script, a software script or Python, um, that you get the data. So Fabio said, here is the script, you can use it. Uh, but then I, I wanted to generate you know, different kinds of situations. And then I generated uh, with software, mathematical software, I think 1,000, 2,000 different uh, trajectories. So you can, you can generate as many as you want. But that is something, of course, then I have to use uh, my uh, knowledge on mathematics and on coding to, to, to make that happen. And I, I read a little bit. Maybe I read, try to read a little bit the papers that Fabio has uh, written about this and... and uh, I have a book here on black hole astrophysics, uh, or several books now, uh, with the whole mathematical. I mean, but you cannot in one year time um, know all the things like a PhD student. I mean, they're working four mm. years non nonstop. So um, I think, yeah, it, it, it. I use a little bit my mathematical knowledge to the extent where I can use it uh, and if it's too too specialized it's always good to collaborate uh, yeah now maybe you can help me understand a little bit about how this data actually becomes music are you mapping specific um, values and information to like 
oscillators and yes. pitches and f- so, yeah, how's that work? That's one way to go. That about. must be a lot of your decision, I guess, right? Yes, like, this is where you your creative part comes in. Yes, absolutely correct. And um, I also see. Uh, so one of my uh, big inspirations in music is Yanis Xenakis. Maybe you heard about him, the gr- uh, French Greek composer. Um, he did the Philips Pavilion in '58 here in Belgium. I don't know if you know the Philips Pavilion. It's this futuristic kind of... Um, it's one of the first multimedia installations uh, built worldwide. It was um, uh, commissioned by uh, the World's Exhibition 58. Um, and it was uh, the architect... I forgot the name of it, A very famous architect, yeah. Anyway, it was Xenakis was involved for the music together with Edgar Varese. Um, and he he used ex- so the strength of Xenakis is using really very deep mathematical theories and making something interesting with it so he's a little bit it's also the founder if you're interested there's a book of in written in 68 music formel formalized music and if you read this book everything that we're doing now so we're uh, talking here with the video and and then the compression it's at ableton the whole idea of premiere ableton all in this book in 68 so this guy is like, um, and he's a big inspirational source because if you v- there's also papers written on his work. the 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 process of um, devising the mathematical techniques and tools to make your composition is also part of the composition itself. So the the, the distinction becomes absent. I mean, and and. Of course, it, when I do, I'm doing the the album, the black hole black hole album. It's it's an art science project. I mean, there's also science involved. Um, and as you say, it's up to the composer to develop the techniques and the, the the algorithms that they want to use for a certain purpose. And the more you develop such algorithms, the more you start to know. Ah, this probably will give this result. This will give this result. And but I'm still also experimenting a lot. I'm also very into algorithmic composition techniques, of course, Max MSP. Um, lately, I've been diving a lot into um, a Jitter, so the whole visual aspects for another project. Uh, I, I'm now into the area of OpenGL, uh, GL as alt, a shader language, so that's 3D visuals. Um, but I mean, this is part of the composition process. That's what I want to try to to, to say. Um, yeah, and that's your own decision. And with the black hole album, one way to use it, the data streams, indeed, is as you say, you take the data streams, numerical. You have to, of course, translate them because sometimes data streams might have values between zero and and five hundred thousand. I mean, if you connect it to an oscillator in Ableton, it will not work. Five hundred thousand hertz. So you have to scale but them. But it makes sense because if everyone doing MIDI is doing this basically, right? Where oh yeah, we have zero to one twenty seven, which oh. is not five hundred thousand. No, That's zero to one twenty seven. Those are our notes. Those are our velocities. We can control every device you use. Um, that's sending MIDI is controlling things using those. That's our limitation. Um, so it must be a lot about deciding what to limit, where to filter. I mean, that's what our minds do too, right? Like yes. we, we can't pay attention to every single thing coming in at us. We'd be overwhelmed. Yes, that's a good, so a very good, you, good, good, good point. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's it's about, it's as you say, I never thought, it's about your own, using your own creative artistic filter. You're a sort of, a, at the same time, a curator and a, and a, and a, and a producer of uh, the sounds. For me, of course, the first step in doing an album such as with the Black Hole piece is creating a, your instruments that you want to use and a sort of a sample. It's not a sample. It's a whole set of different sounds, sound design. So that can be that you have a, a synthesizer such as Serum, for example, and you want to do certain kind of stuff with Serum and you know your way around or use this kind of wavetables. I've been using quite a lot of wavetables also in the album. Uh, and that, that that's one set of sounds. And you might want to produce a track with those sounds. And then... Another set of sounds um, I also used um, that was also super interesting to try to figure out. There's a, a database of um, um, spectra of white dwarfs. So white dwarf is kind of um, a star bigger than the sun. 
so when at the end of its life cycle it will con so basically uh, the fact that that the sun star is stable is because of nuclear reactions inside of the sun and how does it work well you have a lot of mass the sun is super a lot of mass because of uh, the theory of einstein and newton mass attracts so normally if there is no outer force this gets smaller small 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 and it vanishes into maybe a black hole so you have to have something that compensates for the gravitational pull and that's uh, how the uh, nuclear reactions come into play because if you push it um, uh, closer and closer, things start heating up. And then at a, sort, a certain uh, uh, level, there's a lot of uh, helium and, and um, uh, H2O water uh, kind of, uh, well, it's a lot of helium. Um, it starts to create nuclear reactions. And then the nuclear reactions creates an outer pressure. And that's balancing the sun. Because if you would not have the outer force, we would not be here. I mean, that's... that's, that's, that's uh, and the thing is, in the nuclear reactions, helium, if you look at the uh, table of Mendeleev, helium gets to a, a, an, um, an element of a higher mass. So that's, that's uh, there's the famous album of, or track of Moby, we're all made of stars. Or That's really true because, I mean, we are, the res we are star children, all of us, because all the elements that make up our body are being produced inside the course of, of, of a lot of stars because otherwise there would be no life uh, now at the end of its because at the end of its life circle uh, cycle so what happens is the sun has a lot of fuel helium in the beginning it's it gets uh, um, uh, more denser and um, heavier elements until uh, it becomes iron so all the elements that are left is iron and iron cannot burn anymore and then that's the moment when a star can collapse and then be can be depending on its mass if it has enough mass it will become a black hole if it has not enough mass it will become something which we call a neutron star so super heavy one spoonful of a neutron star is uh, as heavy as the whole himalaya if it is a little bit less uh, dense then it will become a white dwarf yeah. so and a white dwarf is sort of a there's a lot of electrons going on yeah, <laughs> I tell you, I'm gonna have an experience tonight looking up at the stars. Ah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it, it's so insane. Like, just there's just no way to really comprehend it. But when you put it in like terms of like a spoonful is as heavy as the Himalayan. Ah, yes. Okay. I yes. Can, even that is beyond my grasp, but it, it does put it into some sort of metaphor that I can understand a little. Yes. Bit. Yes, yes, and that I think is also important for the album to try to. I mean, I've been creating some visuals, um, but with the with the white dwarfs, the thing was I wanted. So there's a whole database of uh, you can uh, uh, of um, spectra of white dwarfs. So those are um, uh, light waves, electromagnetic waves that are being recorded. But I was looking at those spectra. Remember spectrum of Ableton, and the question I had was as a musician. I mean, I'm also a regular musician or a, 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 and as a producer. Can I just turn it into sound? Can I listen to the spectrum? So you have mm -hmm. to find a way to um, make a sound that has the same spectrum spec spectrum as the, the spectra of the light waves. Um, so, uh, yeah. And, and, and in the beginning, I was thinking like, for example, that was an, then it's more like a um, scientific problem for me. Can I do it in max MSP? I was like, okay, uh, uh, okay, I can use the Fourier theorem. So everything is built out of sine waves. But if I want to do it correctly, I would need a synthesizer with maybe 2,000, 3,000 oscillators. So I was like, okay, can that happen in max? Ah, yeah, probably not. If someone knows now, yeah, I don't know if, yeah. But in the end, I used other software. I have three that. oscillators over here you can borrow. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> it's about it. <laughs> but it's nice because I found, in the end, I found a solution using R. It's a sort of a Python kind of programming. I know R because as a, as a data scientist, I use R a lot. Uh, but I thought, I, oh yeah, it also has possibilities to do sound with it. I was like, ah, okay, I know it so well. So that was a solution to, to generate. Uh, yeah, and, and then 
with R, it's easy, for example, I, you have a database of, I don't know, it was eight, 9,000 different spectrum. And with R, you can program a whole script and then you run it. And then you have all of a sudden a, a da database of five, 6,000 samples classify it on your hard drive. So, um, yeah, I mean, but this was really um, connecting the idea of spectrum of Ableton because we know and then to, to so, and this was also a decision of me, of course, another person working with the data would have used it in a different way. I mean, <laughs> there's so many, yeah, it's all new, this field. I have a little bit, I mean, it's not new, but it's a lot of unexplored territory. Yeah, but I have the impression. Uh, it's super cool. Yeah. I, it's, it's like being in a spaceship, you know, into unknown worlds sometimes. Mm. So, yeah. But it seems like it has a lot of the core things we all do when we make music. We are making these creative, artistic filters, even by choosing a genre. We're saying voilà. we're going to, you know, we're going to abide by these certain rules and these guidelines. Have you found any interesting connections with like the the way the physical world works, the way the, I don't know, the quantum physical world or, or the black hole physical world works that maps out nicely with how music works, like music theory? Because you know, music is so interesting, I guess, for you, I'm sure, especially you realize it's very mathematical. Yes. It's also very emotional and it maps out so well to the physical world and you can do calculations to come up with um, very musical sounds. Have you... Did you find anything that like lent itself well or, or created interesting musical patterns that I made think, sense? Um, it forced me to go into also as a sound design perspective to start doing things that I would otherwise not do. Uh, so that's one thing, um, especially with the gravitational waves. Um, and, and there was an interesting, because the work with the gravitational waves was a, a collaboration I had to do with uh, Thomas Hertog. He's a physicist here from the Catholic University of Leuven. Uh, uh, he's also, um, um, he, he worked a long time with Stephen Hawkins. So that was nice that Concertgebouw put me into contact mm -hmm. with him. Um, and I had a meeting with Thomas and then he said, oh, I want you to do a symphony with gravitational waves. Because those are the closest connections I think we have with music and black holes because the name says itself, gravitate waves. I mean, there's waves into it and you can listen to them. You, you, to you told me in the beginning. Um, but the thing is, um, I knew that, of course, the, the whooping sounds, but I mean, I make a whole symphony with those whoop. Whoop, I was like, oh, that's not going to work. I mean, it's never going to work. How, how shit? Yeah, I have to solve this. Uh, <laughs> um, and then um, Thomas told me that you can calculate those gravitational waves uh, in a mathematical way. So uh, there's also, again, simulations of, um, um, uh, of, of mergers of black holes and then the gravitational waves that come out. So uh, it's a whole bunch of numbers. Again, numbers, just numbers. Uh, and with those numbers, you can calculate, I mean, those numbers are not the gravitational waves. With those numbers, you can calculate the gravitational waves. And Thomas said, okay, you can, you can do, hey, you can calculate it with those numbers. I was like, okay, but again, <laughs> I'm not into the field. So I had to figure out, okay, the mathematics, all right. Uh, um, and then the solution um, appeared to be into um, um, generalizations of sine waves. And this was super cool. Mm -hmm you had to use uh, spherical harmonics, and those are three-dimensional generalizations of a sine wave oscillator. So, uh, and using those spherical harmonics, uh, you, you can calculate, so I could calculate the gravitational waves and look at them in three dimensions. So these are really evolving, beautiful, three-dimensional geometrical structures, uh, but it's a sort of a generalization of, of this, the Ableton spectrum, you could say. So that was also for me like, okay, you have the musical thing, but apparently in those gravitational waves, there's a generalization of the whole. So uh, that was, I think, w one, one of the things that, I mean, that really came out nicely. Also, I mean, I learned a lot from that. 
uh, and again it's about s symmetries about yeah it's about waves yeah about vibrations i think that's uh that's the common the common the, again in in quantum physics um you have the normal uh, classical oscillator so a classical oscillator is a spring if you take an um an um a weight onto a spring and you 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 ah let the spring move this is called a classical um a harmonic oscillation in physics uh, and there is physics. Uh, y y y you can describe it with the physics. You have to use an equation, uh, the constant of Hooke. Hooke was um, he was uh, the um, the enemy of uh, Newton. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was discovered at that time. So this, this is Hooke's law to calculate it. Uh, but it is of course the same principle to describe a guitar string and the same principle to describe an uh, an oscillator in a synthesizer because that's the digital version of this uh this thing and in quantum physics there's again the quantum harmonic oscillator and and i mean and these oscillators then in uh, in the collaboration i did with uh with um, matthias kaminski they also had a sort of uh, oscillators uh, of the the black holes oscillating uh, whenever you threw matter into them and then they, they generated the gravitational waves and they are again generalizations of a sort of a sine wave generator you could say so those vibrations are they are everywhere in in it's really strange very strange yeah so uh i think that's and maybe that's the new age connection again the vibrations uh, but the theory of music as we know it with the overtones because basically our, our western musical theory is based on the principle of harmonic overtones so you have a fundamental and uh, then you have an octave and you have a fifth and then you have an octave again and etc and uh, by this you build the classical western harmony um this is also something that you yeah you also find it in physics yeah and also in quantum physics and even in black hole uh, yeah because there's also in the theories uh, on black holes and gravitational waves you can find a fundamental frequency you can find a, a especially with the theory of, of Kaminsky um, that he's working on. There's, I think, a first overtone, a second O. I mean, there's some also some similarities there. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, it. there's so much things to do still there. I mean, phew. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful, really, and just how interconnected everything is and how uh, even as tiny as we get, as, as large as we get, we're it's like all the same <laughs> on some level yeah the same properties and interactions um i think the the black hole the gravitational wave if if i remember correctly um was that little bloop we hear that yeah. they released um that's um pitched up quite a bit yes right like the actual gravitational wave is like subhuman hearing yes i don't know if it's like something like microhertz or maybe you know um i i don't know what it is if it's but it, i know it was so extremely low we, i mean we yes. would never hear it we have to pitch it up to actually hear it yeah yes yeah, I mean, it, and it's also effect a gravitational wave. It's not like in a wave, a sound wave, eh? physically. Hmm. What happens with a gravitational wave is it's a stretching. It, so you have the LIGO telescope. You probably heard about LIGO, um, the telescope with which they detected the gravitational wave. It's this L uh, kind of figure. So basically it's here, a laser, here a laser um, they shoot the lasers to the tubes and then here there is two mirrors and using those lasers they can measure with interference of the laser they can measure the movement in the arms if the arm goes a little bit like this and goes a little bit like that in uh, I mean because of gravitational uh, effects of uh, general relativity because in GR, uh, normally there's also the, the factor if you move very fast, you will become, uh, I think it's taller or smaller. I forgot. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the length is also not absolute. 
And yeah. if the gravitational wave from far away goes to this owl, to this owl shape, what they were trying are trying to detect is uh, the movement and the very tiny, tiny, tiny little movements. And whenever there's a gravitational wave passing, they detect those movements. And then there's a hole. I mean, because I've read a book about the whole thing. I mean, this is this is also crazy how they. I mean. I think it's one of this on a scientific level. We have, of course, CERN, eh, the big, big particle accelerator. But I think the LIGO telescope is also one of the biggest achievements that we had in, in the beginning of the 21st century. I mean, this is like phew, they made like a telescope. It's the same challenge of, of trying to build a telescope on Earth to try to discern a, a, a five piece coin on the moon. <laughs> that's the same situation they they solved it mm. there um but you also see there's a lot of noise huge amount of noise so it's buried under a huge amount of noise this 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 gravitational wave data and you need tons and tons of technology trying to filter out those noise and it's a lot of digital it's a field we call digital signal processing but it's the same thing. I mean, I have here, for example, Universal yeah, Audio DSP. Twin. It's the same thing. It's the same problem. I mean, the Universal Audio plugins, I don't know how they work exactly, but I can imagine there's a, a lot of technology to uh, beautifully emulate the... Uh, uh, for example, um, I use a lot of uh, reverbs from them uh, on the album, not to make uh, uh, publicity, but... Um, most probably, there's a lot of lot of math going on, DSP going on to, to make it, yeah, to make it work. Uh, well, yeah, I guess like when you really, th if you ever tried to like, uh, I see you have some acoustic paneling in your room. When you try to play around with just a room, <laughs> yes. trying to tame it or or control the acoustics there, there's a, a hundred million factors. Yes. And then you sit in your seat, and now you're you're another factor. You're just your body is affecting the yes. sound. Um, everything interacts with everything else so much. It, I, I can't even imagine it. I'm glad there are there are people doing this stuff for us, so we can just plop the plug in it and just choose. Okay, great hall, <laughs> church. Yes, cathedral. of course. Yes, <laughs> and of course. Have something that yeah. takes us there. You know, um, in talking to you, it's really like occurring to me even more so how amazingly delicate and fragile our universe is, our, our, our existence. Like you're just saying like, you know, the sun could just turn into a red giant and you know, that would mean certain doom for us all. <laughs> and, and that's going to happen. Uh, everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. No, it's inevitable. I know. Uh, soon enough, right? Not in our lifetimes, according no, to no, the no, no. Yeah. plan. But um, everything is really mm -hmm. delicate and in such a balance. And um, we were kind of talking a little bit before we started about data itself and how we've become so reliant on data and, and everything. Even just uh, you know when we post a picture online and. We're, we're giving up so much data and you, you were expressing like um, some concerns about um, what this might mean for us because uh, I think I think we're collecting it so fast and collecting so much of it so much more often we're we're almost um, it's almost impossible to keep up with all of the implications and all of the possibilities and all of the potential dangers of that and uh i'd love to hear um what you for you to go in a little deeper about that stuff mm -hmm. you were bringing up earlier yeah we started. And, and as i said in the beginning it's a little bit the, the 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 backbone or the i mean yeah the source to use data for artistic pur i mean if you start using data for artistic purposes you cannot get around the fact that the of the impact of data on our society and our, our whole our everyday lives um, and having now worked as over, I think, 15 years or as a data scientist, I mean, you see a lot of evolutions. Um, and I think there's a lot of big challenges. I mean, as I said, there's a, the climate change problem, which is huge. I mean, we have to deal with it fast, uh, hopefully. 
Uh, and besides that, there's the whole datafication of our society. And we have to be very also the algorithms that are being more, uh, more and more powerful and, and controlling our lives, which inherit a lot of possible yeah, dangers. I mean, yes, uh, I've been reading a book. It's uh, on data. <laughs> they, they draw parallels between, okay, it's, and I also say it in the book, between um, the colonial history that we have in, in, in the West and in the US and, 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 and the whole datification movement uh, of our society. I mean, it's not exactly the same. You cannot compare the whole colonial br- cruelty and, and that's, that's not a... Um, but there's some, some similarities um, because, uh, first of all, I mean, there's a whole problem that... It seems like, and that's also written in the book, uh, we have, of course, our ideas of, of, of a, a capitalist society and, and a free market society. Uh, but it's it seems like um, that's, of course, I think it's an interesting idea that um, everything is being um, turned into value. So we're, we're trying to validate everything. And why do we try to validate everything? To be able to sell it, to have, again, a commerce around it. And we're now at such a point here in, 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 in Europe, for example, or in the US or in Canada, or that people, I mean, we can buy a lot of things. I mean, still, uh, well, not, but I mean, there's some possibilities. Uh, people, I mean, the thing is, um, the limit of uh, people um, buying physical things is, is, is almost reached. I mean, of course, there's people who cannot afford, I, I know, and there's a lot of poverty. And But the next thing, and, and that's the danger we have to be aware of, is the commodification of our social lives using data. And this means that our social relations um, uh, become value. I mean, and we see that Facebook, I mean, Instagram, it all runs on this kind of ideology. And it is an ideology that's being imprinted. Okay, I, I'm a little bit before the generation of, of, of uh, the whole internet boom and, and stuff like that, but younger people are really ingrained into this whole uh, ideology of, of the commodification of your social lives. And this is very dangerous because it also will lead to a sort of a normalization of social interactions. So we will have less freedom. Uh, that's a very, very, very uh, uh, pertinent um, result of that. Uh, and another thing is, I mean, that's now what's now happening and it's going to go further and further. And to give an example, um, in the world of data science, in the beginning, it was all about gathering data. That was like, it, first, get the data. Uh, then the next phase, and that's the phase where we're entering now, is to try to do predictive modeling, they call it. And in predictive modeling, you use the data to try to predict behavior, predict um, syst- evolution of systems. But originally, those are elements that are coming from, from um, uh, not from social sciences, but they're developed in, in a purely um, a scientific, a hardcore scientific um, environment, being applied to social relations to human beings. And this is, this is very dangerous because, if, for example, if you want to get a, a concrete example, you want to get a loan, for example, there's hope, luckily, in, in the West, the Western part of Europe, it's, it's, coming, it's coming slowly and slowly, but there's a lot of predictive modeling. And the predictive modeling uh, will use certain kind of proxies. Uh, we call them proxies. And for example, uh, for me, it could be, I'm, uh, I'm uh, for example, I um, consider, I identify as male, I have this kind of age, I'm living in this area, etc. Um, I have this past medical past, maybe. It's not possible yet, but let's wait for the future. And based on those numbers, I will have a sort of a credit score for an insurance company. And based on that, the insurance company will say, ah, you can get, sorry, uh, the um, uh, bank will say to me, you can get this loan or that loan. The same with insurance companies. I mean, and it goes further and further. And this is all based on on predictive, uh, uh, these predictive models. But the mm. problem is that a lot of people don't realize it's only an approximation of reality. And the, the problem arises when these things are starting to replace reality. And then you're entering a sort of a Blade World, uh, Blade Runner world. Uh, and this is something that's yeah. slow. We have to be really aware of that. That is a very uh, a big concern. And... Of course, you cannot avoid it. I'm also using Facebook, Instagram. I mean, 
So, but it, it also has connections to, to um, climate change because using these predictive models, I mean, you can, you can try to get false information to people. You can try to direct, I mean, what happened with um, um, uh, Analytica, Brit Britannia Analytica with the whole um, elections. Um, that was completely based uh, trying to predict behavior using uh, consumer models, I think they were using. It, it, there was a campaign that also written in a book, the person responsible, for example, and that's then Obama, you would think Obama, okay. But the person responsible for his election campaign, he came from, I think, consumer marketing uh, world. And then they started to, again, try to predict the behavior of people what the reaction would be when they saw this or that kind of ad for the elections and try to direct their behavior in a certain kind of a direction. I mean, you, s you see, this this undermines a lot of free thinking. It undermines democracy. Uh, so, and it's, as you say, it's going faster and faster. And I'm not such a proponent of all those. I try to always make people aware of the limitations of those predictive a models i mean it's pure statistics there's always a chance that there is errors um but of course it's 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 very dangerous to i mean when you're doing data analysis and data analytics there's the modeler so first there's noise on the data the data is not correct you cannot uh, measure the data correctly then there's the models that are being used there's error there then as a data analyst you have to communicate those um, your results to decision makers, to um, key persons who play a key role in communicating those results to a, a broader audience. It could also be to the board of directors of a company, but they all have their own political agendas, so it gets skewed. I mean, with numbers, you can you can twist and turn, and I think uh, that's also what's worrying me is the whole whole. A corona and COVID crisis is, I, I understand it. I mean, people lost faith in uh, science. Um, but a part of it is, is because the communication about the results, also here in Belgium, you had this and that, and, and all of a sudden, if, if you're not into the, I mean, yeah, if you know a little bit, and even then the statistical background, then you're okay. You can more or less sometimes navigate into it, but... They messed it a little bit up. Um, and I, I'm, now we have to try to restore this, this faith in, in science. And also, and that's also what I want to try to do with the project. Science is not absolute. It's just a way to look at reality. It's not perfect. It's not a replacement of reality. And a field where you see that very well is the black hole world. Because, hey, we're talking about... 10 dimensions, 5 dimensions, 23. I mean, this is... Okay, this is not reality. This is completely far off reality. But I, I want to try to make people aware that the same holds true with all mathematical models or predictive models that also have a direct um, effect on our society. Everything has to be viewed into context. And everything, every model has its strength and limitations. And if you take those two balanced into consideration, you can have better science, better communication, and I think better acceptance. And, and hopefully the reluctance uh, on, on science will, will temper a little bit. So, uh, But how to solve it, I don't know. I mean, that's... Uh, um, and then the, 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 I mean, the commodification, we have the commodification of our social lives, so that's a big problem. And also, we are working basically, and that's a, a very nice a thought, of course. Capitalism, I mean, I'm not, comp I'm not against capitalism completely, but I think it should be in balance. I think that now there's imbalances. Some things are like way out of control. Wall Street uh, and, and a lot of other things. Um, um, but... Um, the, the commodification we have our social lives, but the next step, and that's, I mean, that's all already wor worrying a lot, uh, but the next step is going to be our internal bodily structures. 
they're going to want to commodify those using um, maybe nanotechnology. And I'm, 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 I don't want to put any conspiracy theory that has nothing to do with that, but it's just a fact that the medical world will also be interested into maybe in the future putting a sort of a sensor in your body to sense all the different um, activities in your body. And based on that, again, calculate your premium for your insurance, calculate this and that. And, mm. and we have to be very, it can have benefits, but you have to be very conscious about the, the and also like, for example, Elon Musk, when he says, oh, I want to put uh, and connect the brain to, brain to the internet or the brain to, okay, but I'm, I'm directly thinking, okay, but what are your motiv motivations? I, I don't think your motivations are so n noble. I, I can't believe it. I mean, uh, imagine that we're all connected um, via a, a neuro chip directly online, because I think this is one of the future ideas they have. Uh, what, what potential it has, I mean, then you're living in 1984. You d even do not have your own thoughts anymore. I mean, hmm. so... I mean, this is maybe far-fetched, but the idea is already being um, officially proposed. And I mean, it's not that that Elon Musk is is completely considered as a complete crazy clown when he says this. There's people like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, and yeah. Well, I know. Yeah, he he feels um, the connection from our devices as a bandwidth li limitation that we can eliminate with this connection and i think yeah it's interesting because uh we've done it socially right and now you got you know everyone has crazy uncle joe who at thanksgiving dinner or you know at the sunday <laughs> dinner um will say his outrageous things but it stays at the table but now crazy uncle joe has the platform to reach the world and these are <laughs> maybe ideas that shouldn't have really seen the light of day like they do but I, I, if I understand correctly, and this is a really an interesting point, um, it's something I haven't really thought about so clearly, but you're saying we got the data, right? Um, and we've always like heard phrases like the data doesn't lie, you know, the numbers don't lie, things like that. But we have, after we get those numbers, we have somebody that needs to interpret them yes. and then communicate them to someone else who then needs to implement them somewhere else. So there's a lot of points of failure. And what I guess we're seeing a lot in our world with the, the lack of faith in the data and the science is really more the failure from the interpretation, from the communication. Um, and then, of course, um, you can selectively take the parts you want for your yes. own means to paint the picture you want the people to see. Yes, yes. And that is the principle when you don't say something, you don't lie. <laughs> right. I didn't lie. <laughs> I didn't but, tell you the key fact that you needed to know, but I, I didn't lie. But, but you it's, just, it's interesting uh, what you say about like how we can start like giving our, ourselves like these credit scores. And, um, you know, I, I, I love that show Black Mirror that comes on yeah, Netflix. Yeah. And there yes. was an episode where... Um, they had like a phone type device, but they also had some sort of like visual yeah. screen in their head. Okay. And every time they went up to somebody, they could see their score. And you interact. We have this nice conversation. I give you your five stars when you're done. You give me five stars. We had a great time. But maybe I go to the gas station and uh, I get a four for some reason. I wasn't nice enough or, mm -hmm. you know, um, where we can start doing that and because I think we really want like a society where we're pushing a lot towards like getting rid of our judgments of each other. We yes. don't want to, yes. we want to see each other as individuals and who they are. But if we start moving in that direction, we're, we're making snap judgments. We're, yes. we're saying, okay, you know, you were in, I didn't have a good interaction with you on the elevator. So, you know, screw you. I've totally judged you on the tiniest slice of your life, the tiniest moment. So it does, that could be kind of scary because that's exactly what we don't want. We want to see each other past, um, you know, the initial impression and to take into consideration the full picture of who we are. 
that's the reverse. Uh, yeah, it's uh, contradicting each other. Huh? I mean, but it's interesting you say that the credit scoring system that you propose, and it already exists, yeah, for example, Yelp or, or, or you just go Uber. to Uber. Yeah, of course, all those funny Rake movies. The driver, you. The, the SNL, um, I really love the SNL comedy um, uh, movie clips. There is also a lot of movie clips about uh, some oh, about Uber. Jenny from Uber, they're completely left with the whole system. But yeah, I mean, yes, of course, uh, that's a, a sort of a scoring towards um, each other. But then on top of that, there's the credit scoring systems that are being generated by you without your knowledge using predictive modeling, and you have no control over that. So if you're in a bad situation, you're just basically screwed. And there's examples of... Um, uh, there's examples in the book that I, I mentioned about the data colonialism, about the teacher. I think she got a bad rating score by an algorithm or another, and she really had to go to court to change it because it prevented her from, from getting a, a good job, for example. So that's the other thing. And if you're talking about uh, uh, those um, automatic scoring system, that's the credit scoring system. China runs on that now. This is the whole thing in China. It's being implemented. So this is not science fiction anymore. This is a reality there. So based on your credit score in China, you are allowed to have this amount of children. You are allowed to have this kind of car. You are allowed to um, send your, peop uh, your children to this kind of schools, not to those schools. So this is already being implemented in China. And I don't say, I mean, this whole system is going to come over to here, the, the, the other... But it's it's an, a sort of a, a light version, and this and not such a light. I mean, there's a, a modified version, and this modified version because officially China is communist, but this this um, version is being implemented by a sort of neoliberal data fight vision on society, and this is what I see also as a data scientist, and this is what really freaks me out. You know, uh, it's uh, I think uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, hmm. Well, right. I guess, um, you know, if you're getting analyzed for, say, you need a loan to help you get into a better position in your life, and I'm the bank, and I say, well, Valerie, you know, according to the predictors here, uh, you're a risky candidate. Yes. Here, so, sorry, man. And and you're, you're stuck. And yes. then, you know, someone else comes along who fits the, for whatever reason, they just... So it, it, I could see this like further dividing people. Yes, I mean it's it's not level. it's not working against, for example, against um, uh, discrimination. For example, there's also an example. I suppose there's a neighborhood somewhere, um, a bad neighborhood. You have a zip code. So there's a person living into this neighborhood with a zip code attached to, and so uh, this person um, has more difficulty to get a loan. For example, if she wants to get a loan, she has to pay more money. Um, because living in that area, there's also more policing, but because the policing is also predictively modeled. Because of the, the predicted uh, uh, policing, there's more chance of being arrested. Um, if she gets arrested by because of some demeanor or uh, whatever, or even uh, nothing, that also happens a lot. There's more frisking, for example, in such areas. Because her friends are also uh, have more a chance to be frisked, if she gets to a court... She will also. There's also some uh, predictive modeling now in the U.S. being involved into the legal uh, legal uh, department. She will have a more chance to be convicted because of a crime that maybe she uh, she has nothing to do with. So uh, and then you get into a sort of a spiraling situation that is not beneficial for this whole uh, community. It drags this community even in a worse situation than it already was, and it divides and it. Um, discriminates against these, these the discrimination becomes worse and worse. So mm. it's not helping them. So and it's, as you say, it has a potential of uh, leveraging the differences in. Uh, so uh, and there's several reasons, of course, why this happens, and and there's solutions for that, of course. I mean, but there's political solutions, there's technological uh, uh, solutions. This, yeah, I mean, and there's also the problem of the, uh, the underrepresentation of those people and the people who are developing the technology. That's also something that we know already a long time. Um, yeah, 
Um, but I think, yeah, this it, yeah. it moves so fast. We don't get to see the results of it until we're already, you know, ten times further down the hole than we were. And yes, we're really like you know we're becoming aware of how our our social media is affecting us. We're seeing the division between people. We're seeing people's self esteem and mental health suffer. Yes, uh, but it's it's like but we're so far into who's going to give up their account? Who who's going to? Yeah. We it's like we know it's destroying us, but we can't put it down. Yeah, it's no, but it's become too much of yeah, our life. That's we true. Rely on it too heavily. That's true. Yeah, no, no. I mean, if you, if you, uh, yeah, if, if, as an artist, if you, you you don't, yeah, you don't you don't connect to Facebook or or Inst or not no no social media at all. I think it's not so easy. Yeah. So, um, but I think there's some cert certain kind of limits, boundaries that I hope that people will really resist. And that one of the boundaries would be, so the predictive modeling, if that goes further and further, I hope sooner or later people will say, okay, this is not acceptable anymore. Um, and the other thing is, for, of course, if they want to implement um, the commodification of your internal bodily structure eh? with, with sensors inside your body and stuff. I mean, that's that for me would be a no. I mean, I would... Yeah, I mean... Um, I, 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 uh, I've asked this question to my high school students. Ah. Um, you know, they're young. They're, they're kids that have never known the world without an iPhone. Ah, uh, yeah. They, that's you know they're born probably about the same year the iPhone was born. You know, yeah. so that's just all they know. Um, and I I think I'm seeing more and more. I'm like, yeah, put it in me. You know, I like I can I know. watch YouTube while I'm sitting here pretending to listen to you. Sure, <laughs> I can do. There's so many. I mean, it's. I don't think it's just kids though, because I think we're gonna see things like. This can tell if you're going to have a heart attack. This can yes. tell you if you're going to. Yes. And we're going to say, well, well, man, you know, um, yes. If I would have had this, or thanks to this thing, I'm not dead. Yes. Um, no, that's the other thing. Yeah. No, that's correct. That's correct. Yes. There's, it's, it's difficult. Weird. There's so many like possible, really great things. Yeah. It, it it's a, but, <laughs> it's the same with music. It, yeah. With music. And artificial intelligence this is another area field. I, I've been working on a, uh, in 2007, I worked on a project called Emosynth. Um, and with that project, we basically, it was with a little team. Um, we, um, yeah, realized a prototype of a system that can automatically generate music and the music adapts itself to your emotional reactions using biofeedback and using genetic programming. So that's AI. Um, and uh, wait, 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 let me yeah. just make sure I understood you. Yeah, <laughs> yes. The music will pick up on your biofeedback. So that might, was that like your heart rate, your stress body level. temperature, stress um, and heart rate, because they're all like correlated to each other. Yeah. And it'll be like, all right, let's make him feel more calm or, or give yes. him the, the energy burst he needs. Yes, that that's yeah, really. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the idea was uh, what we did was. Uh, you could use the system to uh, automatically generate a personalized soundtrack for a movie with a maximal, maximal emotional impact because the mm. music is personalized, especially made for you. Oh, so like for each viewer? Yeah, different music. So I get a different soundtrack than you yes. that'll reach me. Wow. Yeah, because maybe you hate violence like in whatever and then the thing is going to be, I, okay, I have to do this and that, yeah. That's, yeah. But it was a prototype. I mean, uh, uh, but it, yeah, it was a lot of programming and yeah. Um, but working in that field, so what I basically had to do was make a sort of an um, automatic uh, songwriter, an automatized, automatized, some automized songwriter, uh, and it was written in C plus uh, plus and C sharp. Yeah. So. Uh, um, but with that, I mean, 
it was with a little team. I had a programmer, luckily a professional programmer, because I can program C++, but I'm not a seasoned, uh, this is again another specialty. But I still remember when we had the first prototypes of the, the software, we could I could say, okay, generate and 5,000 songs. Like, yeah, I mean, this is, this is just software, you know, like, and then you can listen. Tuk, 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 wow. tuk. Um, but well, in a way that we do use music a lot to fit our mood and our voila. emotion. If I say I want to go to the gym, you know, I want yep. music that's going to... So instead of having to search through playlists and albums and skip the yes. songs that are the ballads. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, and this, this idea has not... I mean, because I know that uh, Spotify and other providers are uh, trying to make certain kind of algorithms to... But this, our idea, well, what I had was get went much further, um, I think. Uh, but of course, the implementation was it was primary and it was a prototype. But it got me thinking, like, um, yeah, part of the future. And we also, it, for example, there's a merger between Native Instruments and Isotope, which su yeah. is super great. You heard probably about it. The two companies merge together. Isotope, I mean, is amazing. The AI that is an isotope, I'm like, whoa, this is really amazing. Uh, so we'll see what, what comes out, but I think the potential for AI and, and, and music is going to be, in the future, there's going to be radio channels that are completely driven by AI. Yeah. There's going to be songs that, I mean, the only thing that that's still, uh, so songwriting is rather, you can do some quite good songwriting using artificial intelligence, but of course, we have our studios here, um, the production is more difficult, you know, the, the, to have like a 60 track, different 60 different track uh, mix using AI. But in 10 years time, I think it's going to be, it's going to be a reality. Yeah? So, uh, mm -hmm. and this is going to put musicians in a completely different perspective. And, and we're going to have to maybe reinvent a little bit of the things that we were doing. Uh, I don't believe that the human creativity and, and, and creative intelligence and the inspiration. I mean, I don't believe that a machine can replace a human being. No, no, no way. I mean, and there's mathematical reasons for that. But uh, a part of our tasks will be, yeah, will be replaced. I think, and there's a lot of musicians who don't, producers who don't um, 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 realize it or don't want to realize it or, I mean, or don't believe it. Um, yeah, and that's another aspect. I think it's interesting to see how that will. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for yeah, there is something, you know. Uh, it is. Yeah, I agree with you. Like, I've I've already heard music that was, you know, artificially created, and you're kind of like, you can see the writing on the wall. Um, we're getting there fast too. Um, there's it might have to be like just i don't know maybe we'll get like more excited about different things like just seeing somebody playing their guitar yes in person. yes yes that could you be know, yes um, just like i had my band practice last night and that's just three guys bass guitar drums some microphones yep. to sing on um and the, and the freedom in that is is great and but uh yeah the to think it's not coming i think i mean how could you say that anymore about anything really Cause yes it seems like, yeah maybe yes you, you know maybe yeah. i need to move to that mountaintop with my acoustic guitar so i can experience life a little slower and uh <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 of course yes of course no 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 slow time down but but it's not that I don't believe in musicianship. I mean, I'm also, yeah. I mean, one of my big inspirations, I, I played, I studied jazz piano already for a long time. I played piano for a long time. And I'm, I mean, I listen, one of my inspirations, like Miles Davis, um, um, uh, Coltrane, uh, for example, uh, Monk, I mean, Bill Evans, I'm a very big Bill Evans uh, so those are also very big inspirations for me because of the organic element and uh, their creativity. I mean, this is like next level and this is, yeah, this is super analog. So um, no, but I mean, AI is going to be, yeah, it's going to be a factor that's, yeah, 
that's going to be there. Huh? Yeah. yeah, and I think for creating that mood, if we're, it depends. You know, it depends. Like right, like um, people use music for different things, and yeah. um, some people just want the beat when they're partying with their friends. Yeah, and no judgment. You know, that's no, fine. Yes, and, um, that's true. I I use music like that sometimes too. I, I just want something to yeah fall asleep to or 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 dance with my friends for it's very different than when i'm feeling introspective and you know all the different things but where i think a unique segment of the population as music creators too that we do see it differently so and it's it would be just i'm sure you could say this about any any uh, type of art film you know like i definitely do not appreciate film on the level of a filmmaker. I I just don't even understand how deep it goes. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah. Just as so like I might be happy to just consume the mainstream simple thing cuz I want to just have a nice evening, you know, Pull sit off. on the couch yep. and just relax. I'm not there for yep. the intellectual artistic yep. experience as much as I am with music yep. maybe. And then it could be nice if there's an AI engine, for example, that's generating a whole movie for you, because that will also be a possibility in the future. I mean, with or different plots, or I mean, one of my dreams is to have like, uh, and uh, I'm also a little bit of a horror movie fan. I'm still waiting for like, and um, with holograms, 3D holograms, like a zombie movie, like uh, Day of the Dead or mm. something like that really with 3D uh, holograms, uh, surround sound, smell, everything, and then in your room, like... Um, <laughs> but yeah, we have to wait for that. Um, and you want that to happen? <laughs> no, now you I'm just curious to... zombie holograms? Cu cu curious <laughs> how that would be, yeah, you know, if you would like yeah, your human you condition. Well, like the virtual reality, right? Yes. Hey, in a way, you know, I was kind of laughing to myself when you were talking about... Um, scientists in virtual reality making these uh, like red gi red giants, red dwarfs, red, red dwarfs, red, a, yeah, yeah, red they're, giants. They're simulating sorry. these in VR. I'm picturing like you know a, a kid playing Grand Theft Auto, you know, stealing cars and like shooting people for no reason. <laughs> and now the scientist is destroying the entire solar system. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like yes, of course. Step up. Next step right. to uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Get bored. We got bored stealing cars in the video game, so now we're, we're destroying entire solar systems. Yes, yeah, <laughs> no. But it, the red giant face, you can check it up. I don't know. That it's in a couple of billions of years that it will happen. Yeah. So we have to we have to escape. I mean, that's true. So. I mean, that's what, where the, the, yeah, the people who are, want to go in space are right. We have to escape. No sunblock for that. Just get out. No, of here. no, no, no. Because it's um, no. There will be. Uh, I think might might be a white dwarf that's going to be left over. That I'm not sure. I should check the lit literature. But it's going to be much hotter here. Eh? So th th it's going to expand and the temperature is going to rise. So everything is going to. Yeah, uh, it's going to burn. I mean, unless we are no. That's uh, we have to get out. Uh, but personally, I'm very interested into time travel myself. So, um, yeah, the whole wormhole thing is very interesting. So, um, yeah, um, that would be... Well, that would be interesting, right? Because then we could figure out if our solutions to our problems are working or making them worse, and we come back here and yes. say, oh, we better not do that. Yeah, you can see for climate change, you can go a hundred years uh, and then see uh, measure the temperature and then say, okay, Ooh, that was a has, bad idea. Let's it has back. risen three degrees. Uh, things uh, like Belgium doesn't exist anymore. Well, let me ask you this: uh, If we can get, you said we can get into the future. Would we be able to get back though? <laughs> ah, <laughs> to say, um, hey guys, uh, <laughs> no, not not right now because then you would need a wormhole. Uh, no, but it's all theory, yeah? So to go into the future, mm. I mean, yeah, because if you read those papers, then, I mean, um, then it's like, okay, let's, another idea, that's a super cool idea, is to use black holes as um, an, um, an, um, a driver for a spaceship. That's also possible. So there's several possibilities uh, to make spaceships, and one of them, uh, because you need a lot of fuel eh, to, uh, to go very far away, and, and the black holes... Uh, small oh, for the energy yeah, yeah 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 but this is all i mean if you read i mean these those are real scientific research 
So, I mean, it's based on real science, but then, I mean, you have the ideas or sentence like, okay, let's take mass, let's create a black hole, let's um, try to to move the black hole to a place where, I mean, but, and I mean, this is all theory, of course, but okay, um, who would have thought could when it, my... Could it be possible to create th hmm? those, like a black hole for energy in, in one of these, like, colliders? And yeah. use that to get rid yeah. of uh, our dependence on yes. uh, fossil fuels and things like the, that. The problem with little black holes, so uh, that's again um, the um, theory of back and whole world back and, into it. Back and, no, that's one thing that can happen statistically. So there was protests in the beginning in CERN, people protesting against the fact that that would happen. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, the problem is, and that's again Hawk and Beckenstein, the smaller the black hole, uh, the shorter it lives. So a very tiny, minuscule black hole would exist only for, let's say, I would say something, 10 to the minus 20 seconds or something like that. So it's directly gone. You cannot, I mean, mm. that's a little bit, you cannot make like sort of a, it's not matter, you cannot hold it. That's uh, the problem with those those things. Uh, yeah, they exist for a very very short amount of time. Um, mm. But that's with other particles. If you look at uh, at the data from CERN, I mean, um, there's a lot of exotic particles that are being created, but they're not hap they're not uh, an abundance in nature, just because um, kaons are, for example, muons but they exist a very very tiny fraction of a second. I mean. Uh, but the microscopic, of course, it's the microscopic world works on another time frame than our world. Yeah. That's and the macroscopic world again works on another time frame because one year for the existence of our solar system is really nothing. I mean, or for for the Milky Way, for example, it's mm. so. But maybe yeah, I don't yeah. Um, um, but but time travel, I think, yeah, we have to, yeah, maybe look into it. Maybe not in our lab. But if you, I mean, if you look uh, re radioactivity, for example, eh, the applic applications, when it, yeah, it was first discovered by Marie Curie, she, she, she knew the potential, but I mean, how, how did it, I mean, Einstein, the discovery of the famous formula ESMC squared, normally there's some extra terms, I mean, the, the, the F, I mean, it, it's given us all the, of course, all the nuclear energy, but it's given us smartphones. Um, all, I mean, no, a whole computer is based on, on, on it's also, I mean, so, uh, uh, and quantum physics, the same. Quantum physics was discovered in the beginning of the 19th century. Okay, it took 100 years. Yeah. But without quantum physics, I mean, yeah, we would not have a computer. I mean, pfft. It's just not be mm. because we don't understand how electrons behave. To make microscopic electronica, you need a lot of quantum physics. So, yeah, we would not have all the synthesizers, plugins, Ableton, <laughs> nothing of that. Only a plain old acoustic guitar and a double bass and a drum right. and a vocal. <laughs> Which isn't too bad. <laughs> Which is also cool, of course. Yes. Yeah. No. Well, that's wild. And who's to think uh, that there might just be some discovery around the corner that will take us on a whole other road? Yes, also uh, possible. For good or evil, but uh, hopefully yes. we'll use that well. Are yes. you optimistic about the future? How do you feel? <laughs> um, mixed feelings. I mean, um, I'm looking forward for, of course, the progress in technology and science. But um, as I said, yeah, I mean, the other, the dark side, I'm wondering about, uh, wor worrying about, of course, uh, the, the climate change. I mean, this is something and the datification and, and the implications, but I don't think it's too late. I mean, I'm not an, uh, how you call it? An, uh, an, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we can, yeah, I'm like nihilist. That. No, I think we're humans yeah. and then, uh, but also as to climate change, I don't believe in geoengineering. I mean, there's people 
who really uh, say, okay, in the beginning they denied the climate change. Now they say, oh yes, it's happening and we're going to geoengineer the earth. That's another solution to try to put mirrors there or put, uh, for example, in Saudi, Saudi Arabia or in Dubai, I read there have a technique to make it rain over there using mm. technology. But of course, the earth is an ecosystem and eh? you cannot... Phew, I mean, this is crazy. Yeah. Uh, so one uh, thing affects everything oh. else. But yeah, but I think we have to get out. Of course, we have the Corona, which was also and still here and there over everywhere. That's of course another challenge. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's another challenge that's being put the other problems a little bit. Okay, now there's the the um, conv um, the convention on the climate change and in, uh, in uh, where is it in. Scotland or in Dublin or going on? Yeah, I think I think maybe Glasgow. Sorry, Glasgow. So. Yeah. So it puts it in the picture again, but hopefully it will not be forgotten. So optimistic passing. Yeah, but in between the two, I think. Uh, yeah, but I believe we can do a lot, and I mean, and and good. I mean, yeah, awareness. I think the most important thing is awareness and to try to convince people. Um, yeah. Uh, and I do it maybe in a naive way with signs and, but yeah. Um, well, it's cool. And look, I'm having this art. conversation with you on, on the music production podcast, yes. which is definitely this type of science is not, not happened yet on the show. Um, no. Ah, that's yes. something I love about ah, yes. doing it and talking to all kinds of people and someone like yourself is that we can go down different wormholes to, uh, yes. Use yes. a pun for you, <laughs> but we get a chance to connect it all and and learn about other things. And um, th you know, through my study of music, it's taken me in so many different directions. And I, I find all this stuff fascinating. And um, I think it's you know extremely important for everyone to consider uh, you know kind of like the small role we all play in the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Because we're, I mean, we're in a way we're kind of like atoms in some larger thing. Yeah. Each yes. one of us bouncing around, affecting each other, and uh, changing our charges from positive to negative. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I like it, and I, I think what you're doing is really awesome and impressive, and um, we should definitely tell people to head to check out the music. Um, Ah, yes. Mi Micromidas is how you say it. Yeah. Micromidas. So, Micromidas. Micro the Micro title is Micromidas ADS CFT001. And it's being released on the label, because I said Ash International, which is part of the Touch label. Uh, and uh, you can now already pre order via the Bandcamp of Ash International. And the offi official release date is the 3rd of December. So it might be mm. a Christmas uh, present. <laughs> it's going to be released as a digital download, as a CD also. So, um, yes. Well, good, great uh, Christmas present for uh, a, a yeah. someone that's into both music and science and yes. astronomy. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that could be, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. No, it, I mean, it's yeah. very interesting and, um, of course, mysterious as well. But to know that the sounds you're hearing have a direct connection to aspects of the universe um, makes it really interesting and fun. And, it, and in a way, it has this like kind of like earthly feeling about it too, where we recognize some of the sounds and I, I, I like it a lot. And it's... Thank you. You know, it's just another way we can make music and and just when you think you've like run out of ideas and I've done all those chord progressions and yes there's just it's a great reminder to myself to everyone to just you know keep those eyes open those ears open for interesting ways to create yeah yeah of course i mean we haven't talked too much about uh, music production but uh, yeah i mean that's also the other side uh, but that's the yeah um uh, because it's not because I'm doing this, yeah, as I say, normally I was, I co came from another field, really musical, melodic kind of stuff. Uh, and I also use that in this album. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was also working a little bit in the dance music industry. So I also did vocals. So I'm a singer. 
normally, but now <laughs> with the whole album, not uh, for the moment. Well, uh, I, you did mention, and I wanted to say this earlier, but I, I yeah. forgot. Um, you did mention you studied like pop music, electronic pop music. Yes. That's not what this is. No, this is, this not, is not electronic <laughs> pop music. No, no, not at all. Yeah. But I teach, I teach at the conservatory here. So I teach uh, on electronic music production and sound synthesis and sound design. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, to make the album, that's what I think I combined um, my background there is. So I had my old compositions, blah, blah, blah. And then I went to the studio and I was like, yes, and now I'm going to use all the plugins and I have a little bit of hardware and to really make the sound like optimal as possible. Like I was like, I, I think I mixed over a year, not constantly, but mixing better and better and trying to make it better and better and better. So, uh, and, and it paid off. I mean, I, yeah, uh, I also got new plugins and then with this Universal Audio, I got also Plugin Alliance. I mean, a whole, using a whole bunch of different plugins to really, the idea to try to get a sort of an analog feel into the sound. That was for me like, I have some references, some records that I really like a lot. Um, and I mean, I went to try to get a little bit in that direction. Uh, so because I, I can also be very uh, passionate and um, how you say um, intrigued by good, maybe very commercial pop music. When I listen to it and like, and the sound is like, I'm like, whoa, how did they mix this or produce this or the vocal licks or like, so uh, and that's what I combined, I think, in the records. Yeah. So uh, because I also like it a lot, I also like pop music a lot. I mean. So uh, yeah, and, and the album was was mastered. That's maybe nice and uh, interesting detail. It was mastered, and thank you uh, to Simon Scott. He mastered the album, and Simon Scott is also um, he has a company called SPS Mastering. But he's also the drummer of the band Slow Dive, the shoegaze band. Mm. So, yeah, I saw that. That's pretty yeah. awesome. And it was cool when so I sent. So I was like, oh, hey, oh, yeah, all right. Uh, Simon is gonna. So it was like a little bit. Um, imp I'm pressed, or how you call it. Uh, uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to send the album over. I hope he likes it because Slow Dive, you know, it's like a legendary band. Uh, um, and then I got a reply. He really liked it a lot. So I was like, okay, whew. I mean, mm. already one person that's like, uh, yeah. So uh, that was really nice to hear. Yeah, it's a uh, much different style. <laughs> than, yes, than yes, was. yes, yeah. yeah, 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 of course. Yes, yes. But Simon also makes experimental electronic, very nice experimental electronic music. And I understand mm -hmm. uh, by the record label. And so uh, uh, Touch is the, that's Mike Harding, why they said ah, Simon can uh, do the mastering. It completely made, it was a very good fit. So, uh, mm. yeah. And in meanwhile, yeah, of course, Slow Dive, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's an amazing band. It's fantastic work. And uh, congratulations on the Thank upcoming you. release, all the hard work and energy. I mean, you really put a lot into it um, for, and a lot of interesting collaborations. And it's pretty cool to see how it just takes so many different aspects of your life and your interest and puts it into this artistic project. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, was inspiring. That was the idea of the. And yeah, I think it, it naturally evolved. It was not mm -hmm. like, yeah. That was a little bit the problem when I was working more into the dance music community. Before I was more, felt more pushed towards like, it has to sound like this, it has to do. And, and with this project, I was like, okay, phew, naturally, uh, yeah. Um, and it could be after this experience, I have a an, uh, an, uh, follow up record already ready. Um, um, that's using the same kind of techniques, not data, um, the same kind of sound design combined with more musical elements. Mm -hmm. um, and in the future, I do, do not exclude that I will even go more in a musical direction or maybe do some dance music again with the, with the new ideas and techniques that I now discovered. That's a little mm. bit... Uh, we have right, to now you can, see. you've given yourself a whole nother palette and set of tools yes. for any style that you want to pursue. Yes, yes, yes. That's how I feel too when I, I go into another world musically. Then it's like I can come back to some of my older roots and I'm fresh again. 
Uh, ah, yeah. Your roots like. are in. Uh, what are, where are your roots lying musically? Uh? Oh, like just rock guitar and um, alternative music from the '90s, and you know that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I started as a guitar player, so um, it, yeah. Every time I learn new stuff, uh, it's really fun to explore new terrain. But then it's fun to see like how it affects the stuff I used to do or the stuff maybe I'm more, um, I, I still to this day feel like most at home on a guitar. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, okay, just, yeah. Even when I've been out of practice and I'm a little slow and sloppy, I still see the guitar and I understand it, you know, really well. So it's, mm -hmm. it's like home. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have the same with piano, I think. Piano and vocal, mm -hmm. but especially piano. It's like, oh. Okay. Different chords, different uh, yeah, chord changes, uh, voicings, very cool mm -hmm. piano. All these voicings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can send people to well to your website. Would that be the best place? Do you have uh, a preferred way? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. And also, I think to the the band camp of the album. Um, yeah. Okay. And on the website, indeed, yes. There's an, an page on Micromeras on my website, especially uh, regarding the Micromeras project. But in general, there's info on the other projects. And I also um, do, um, from time to time, um, uh, work online workshops on mm -hmm. specializing yes. into different kind of sound synthesis techniques uh, and some arranging and some composition uh, so, um, yeah, I have workshops on um, analog synthesis, frequency modulation synthesis, wavetable synthesis. And I've mm. developed my own, I think, methodology, starting a little bit from the, the physics point of view. So using a little bit of the physics, but not the formulas. Uh, and um, developing a sort of an, a core map of how to think about sounds and use that to teach synth sound synthesis. Uh, so, for example, with with frequency modulation synthesis in the next kind of an edition next weekend coming up, the problem I hear a lot there is that it's very difficult to understand <laughs> what you're doing with all those algorithms, uh, and I try to find a little bit of a methodology into it using mm -hmm. some signs. That's basically. Uh, yeah. so, oh, that's that's cool. I I think um, it'd be really nice to hear your perspective on that. Um, and uh, you know the sine the sine waves that are often used with f FM synthesis, um, like you're saying, so fundamental to so much in the universe. Uh, and they've said that I've heard anyway that we still haven't tapped into like half the sounds you can do with like a DX7. Ah, so yes, ah yes, that's pretty exciting. I'd yes, yes, be and interested I'm to see your thoughts on that, and ha love to hear about you. Yeah. Uh, going through just frequency modulation yeah 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 no, no i have a dx7 here an old and that's also featured on the album uh, an old dx7 here uh cool. no we're using for the workshop dext um, uh -huh. um yeah yeah plug in yeah um no i mean the, the the starting point is of course the formula of fm synthesis it's basically um it's based on bessel's functions so there are mathematical functions but but what you have to know, it's a sort of you could see it as a sort of an yeah extrapolation of uh, ring modulation. That's not frequency, but it's a similar kind of, of effect. Um, no, I mean the thing is, you have to know uh, when I teach it, you have to know a bit of acoustics. For example, if you take a violin, what is the basic sound um, um, wave that comes out of a violin? It's a sawtooth wave. But why is it the sawtooth wave? This is because of the physics, and you can rather easily explain it. For example, a guitar, not an, an, a violin, a plucked guitar. What is the basic sh wave shape you would need there? If you look at the physics, uh, you can, an, at a white or blackboard, explain it. Well, it should be an, um, an, uh, a pulse wave, uh, so in, uh, a square wave with a, with a narrow. And there's also scientific reasons for it. And that, that all is um, um, uh, connected to the acoustics. So, uh, yeah. And once you know a little bit of those basic principles, you can use, uh, because if you know how FM synthesis works, so you have different algorithms, the most in, uh, in, um, simple is a carrier and you have a modulator, and you know if you do an FM, 
you add up um, harmonic overtones um, positive to the positive side and you can also add them to the negative side which means you flip the phases you can start doing some math and then you know ah, to make for example an um, a, a saw wave on an FM synth I need is in a carrier and modulator with a CM ratio it's called of one over one and I need some feedback and uh, in this way I will get a sawtooth wave and this can be the starting point to generate a violin sound for example so but it starts with knowing more about acoustics and I think that's a little bit underestimated uh, in s the world of sound even on sound engineer well acoustics of instruments uh, I think music producers do not always know. Uh, yeah, we had some courses, uh, good courses on that, and of course, yeah, being mathematician, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Hey, it sounds yeah. fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and, and well, we'll yeah. have to put some links to that in uh, the show notes too. So yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Workshops. Yeah, that would be great. Yes, that would be cool. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for sitting down and talking. This has been kind of a mind-blowing discussion yeah, and yeah, okay. I think it's, your work is really really incredible and to really get a sense of how far it goes is yeah it's inspiring so it, it makes me want to work on my projects thank you and good to hear maybe one day I don't know if I'll go quite as far into the universe as you but <laughs> let me find know find some new th <laughs> new ways to inspire new ideas it's yeah. a great story all right Thank you for having me, and uh, yes, so uh, see you maybe uh, next time around. Yeah, we'll have to definitely talk again. I think there's a lot, yes. a lot of places we can go. Cool. So thanks again, and um, thank you everyone for listening. Check out Valerie's work. You could go to Valerie Vermerlin. Um, that's V A L E R Y V E R M E U L E N dot net. We'll yes. put that in the show notes though, cool. so you can just click on the links, and we'll have some other good stuff in there. Uh, but so much incredible work. And make sure you check out the album coming out on December 3rd, you said. Yes, on the label Ash International. Yes. Ash International. Perfect. Thanks yeah. so much. Great. And have a great day, everybody. Take care. Cheers, eh? Bye, eh?